This episode of the Kill by Kill podcast is brought to you by the all new Scream. It's now available to buy or rent tonight on digital. Scream stars Nev Campbell, David Arquette, and Courtney Cox. This hit new movie is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and critics are calling it 100% terrifying. Buy it on digital today, and you'll get access to killer bonus content, including deleted scenes, casting reviews, and much more. Now, Scream is available at participating retailers. It's rated R, and it's from Paramount Pictures. If you listen to our review of the new Scream, you know that we love every bloody minute of it. Now, maybe this is your first time, or you just want to relive the whole experience. Well, now everyone has a chance to watch this new entry in the Scream franchise. It's on digital in your very own home. And to celebrate, I have five copies to give away to our Kill by Kill listeners. All you need to do is email us at killbykillpod at gmail.com with Scream in the subject line. You tell me your favorite scary movie, and you can watch Scream on us. Uh, Do it today. Oh, and by the way, the body count continues. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sexy time is here. That's right, we're talking about traces of red on Kill by Kill After Dark. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal Patrick Hamilton coming to you once again from Palm Beach, where people have three lives, their public life, their private life, and their secret stupid life. This is uh, Kill by Kill. Uh, and, you know, uh, we usually talk about a horror movie, but every other week we like to dip into the world of supposedly erotic thrillers in the hopes that uh, a sexy person's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes we can make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person I trust that if I need to stash all of the things that would call me out as the killer, they'll never notice that I've put them in their apartment and their partner's garage. The one, the only Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? Uh, Before we proceed, I just wanted to make a statement. Sure. Uh, While I am not uh, retracting my apology for suggesting a night in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do believe sincerely that uh, with you suggesting traces of red, uh-huh. we are now even. Yeah. Oh, no, we're totally even. <laughs> even Stevens, baby. You cannot throw this in. You cannot throw a night in heaven in my face anymore after this. <laughs> yeah. All it took was two weeks and, uh, you know, one random dart in our bullpen of, of erotic thrillers to come up with one, something that's just equally as stupid. And while... Uh, a night in heaven was formless. It just was a week in a life of three very dumb people. This is a week in a life of people who aren't so much human beings as they are little chess pieces for the screenwriter to play with because they have zero human emotions or desires. Oh my God. <laughs> these, these people are props. Oh my god! The, the, the first thing, the first thing that we, you know, the, really the only thing that 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 matters about this movie is, um, this is probably the most egregiously miscast movie I have ever seen in my entire life. Uh-huh. I, I mean, you could say you know, for all of um, uh, a night in heaven's faults. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least Leslie Ann Warren, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, makes a, 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 you know, an, an undersexed housewife a character. Yeah. She's, she's believable in that role. Correct. It's a, it's a dumb role, but she's, she is believable in it. Absolutely. No one in this movie is right for their roles. And in fact, they are so wrong for them that it's distracting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just trying to 
I, you know, if, in your mind's eye, who would you cast for this? This and the, everyone would be like half a decade younger and infinitely sexier. And I think they thought maybe they were going for realism, and they just landed on I, C I list availability. Don't know you. You've got Tony Goldwyn as I don't even know what the fuck is going on with his character. He he's in the best scene. Let's say best and worst <laughs> scene in in this movie. We'll get right. to that. Uh, you you've got uh, um, Jim Belushi. Well, you know, actually James Belushi because it's a serious <laughs> role. Um, right. Who is described by Tony Goldwyn at one point is, "Oh, you're such a fucking stud, man." <laughs> And, and, you know, again, I, I keep coming back to uh, in, in, the, in this uh, series that we're doing, every single one of the, the male stars in these movies, they are all, they all desperately want to be nine, nine and a half weeks era Mickey Rourke. Right. Yeah. yeah. J- just a sort of sleazy and dangerous, you know, but, but still, but still, you know, unbelievably sexy anti-hero which none of those words apply to jim belushi <laughs> i'm sure mrs belushi finds it very right. sexy but but this is not an actor one would expect to see playing a character that is just basically the cock of the walk of of palm of the palm it, beach I, scene 100 uh, percent uh, believe you know uh, agree with you it's not to say that there aren't legions of women who would just throw themselves at this albanian hunk of man meat uh that is jim belushi um i believe he can have charisma in the right role but he is not michael douglas i, I think there's a thing here where it's 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 slightly changing over time it's morphing it's becoming a mix of Mickey Rourke with Michael Douglas. That's probably closer to and accurate. Because they're just, you know, one people's sexiest man alive after the other sort of uh, Caucasian. Um, and they're what the roles were written to be. Conversely, you have Lorraine Bracco, right? An actress who's been very good in a lot of things. Here. And, it, and it's very, very yeah, attractive. No. You know, when when she looks right. like herself. But here they've tried to doll her up in some sort of Sharon Stone cosplay. No, I think it's more I think it's more I think it's a little more Melanie Griffith. She's certainly than, trying than, to talk like Melanie Stone. Griffith. She's got that kind of hus sort of weird kind of husky yes. baby voice. Like it's like like Husky and ba- husky and baby at the right. same time. Not, but trying to lighten the tone and deepen it at the same time. Like, like this. And she's got this terrible, I don't know if it's a dye job or a wig. It's, it's got to be a dye job. She does There's not no have wig a, she, alive that can replicate the roots that she has going on here. She, she, you know, does not have the complexion for blonde hair. And I know this because I tried to dye my hair blonde when I was 13 and it looked fucking terrible. And she is just supposedly sex on two legs for no right, reason both of them are playing, whatsoever. Right. And then you find it like she's kind of a red herring but not really at the same time and then in the end her character is killed off and you find out that she has absolutely nothing to do with right. any of it she, just, she, has, she has nothing to do like this weird subplot where her and tony goldwyn who's a sort of you know upstanding husband and father and he's you know sort of sort of uh, uh you know, reads as the only decent person in the whole in, in the whole story but he ends up falling for her feminine mm. wiles and and but you know they this affair that they have is completely irrelevant to to anything and anyone that has to do with the actual plot. Yeah. And they're trying for this sort of hard boiled neo sunlit noir esque look that would be nailed in much better movies. It's also, you can tell whomever the screenwriter is would just sit back in his chair and Stephen J. Cannell whip a paper up into the air, just (laughs) thrilled with what he's doing there. And it just, None, none of these characters are people. They're simply characters in a script. Um, I, I want to read a little bit from Roger Ebert's 
two star review of this as as if this that's as if this was seen in theaters, <laughs> but somehow Roger Ebert <laughs> reviewed this, and he says, of course, the motive for most serial killings in the movies anyway involve childhood trauma, but the solution of this movie involves a basic movie principle that I've identified in my glossary of movie terms as the law of economy of characters. I did not know that this was the movie that this was born in. Is that right? That's this what is what he invented it for? it for. And I was like, holy no shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it perfectly encapsulates the point. And with this, the law of economy of a character states movie budgets make it impossible for any film to contain unnecessary characters. So applying this rule, an audience member can guess the identity of the killer by finding the character who seems otherwise unnecessary. The law is a little harder to apply in traces of red than in most movies because several of the characters seem unnecessary. <laughs> Not to see they, they are. Just, every character here is unnecessary for dramatic representation. And yet at some point, like there's at least five different characters where it's kind of suggested that maybe they're yeah. the killer. And, and if you don't, and if you don't understand that, they'll, they'll linger on someone sort of holding a knife and kind of playing <laughs> with it. Like, <laughs> Everyone has to have one shot like where maybe they look they like, did it. I could murder you. And you're like, yeah, all of you could murder one another. Could you do it in the next five minutes? Because this movie supposedly has a runtime of an hour and 42 minutes of which I would say 80% are unnecessary. Well, everything you need to know about what kind of movie traces of red is, uh, can be summed up in the fact that it literally starts with a, you might be wondering how I got here in the beginning of the movie. And I kid you not, I watch it, I'm like, and I said out loud, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And they're trying for some, like, uh, Sunset Boulevard, you know, character posthumously narrating the, the story, even though in Sunset Boulevard, you don't realize until the end of the movie that he's actually yeah, Spoiler dead. alert for a movie that came out in the mid fifties, but yes, uh, that's very true. Also. Well, I'm going to spoil <laughs> this movie too. He's also not dead. <laughs> she is not dead. Despite all of our hopes and dreams being wedged into the corner of, Oh my God, I hope. Jim Belushi fucking dies in this movie because the more you watch him, the more you wish upon this character's death and you know, it's coming, but it's not coming soon enough. And so, yeah, he narrates a la sunset Boulevard DOA pick your poison. It's all the same sort of neo-noir dreamy nonsense, but somehow in the middle of Palm beach, you have two Dorcases. One is a cop. The other one is running for states running for state center. Senator, he, he doesn't even have a political position currently, um, but he's all but forgotten. Yeah, it's the it's it's the da- it's the dad from uh, That's Boy Meets where World. I know that fucking <laughs> face from. Yeah, sure. And I actually saw him in two movies in the same day. <laughs> I uh, I because I watched that, and then later in the evening I watched Deathbed, the bed that eats. Oh my god, he's in Deathbed. He is the guy that has his hands dissolved, a little skeleton. Hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same actor. <laughs> Better movie. <laughs> Deathbed, the bed that eats. It's somehow a more coherent movie. Well, I think it delivers on its its stated premise because there is a deathbed, a bed that eats in deathbed. Whereas, I guess there are some traces of red, but they they keep falling back on this. They they keep falling back on this lipstick that uh, that that is being used by the killer, and yet they never connect it to the actual source of why the killer is killing. You have to put it together in your head that that was the color of lipstick that both their that their mother, who we learn, abused them. Which this movie is like playing around with child abuse, like it's uh, y- y- they have no choice but to kill. They just have. Oh yeah, to do I, it. I feel yeah, I feel like that the the screenwriter like was trying to come up with a you know what what is the what is the grittiest most horrifying twist I can uh, I can put in this. Oh wait a minute, mm. boys can be molested too. <laughs> 
I never heard of it by women. No. Oh God. And if you're, if we, if we sound slightly callous, it's not our fault. I'm sorry, but the movie has forced us to discuss this by making it a plot point in a movie that really, it has no right. A, a, being a any plot point of. that, that goes nowhere, mm-hmm. nowhere. It, it, it is a throwaway moment to give some dimension to a character that has no dimension. Right. And does not explain why one of the other characters is now a serial killer. If we, if we, if you feel like, well, guys, you have to tell me like something of the plot. I wish I could. I watched this movie one and a half times. I'm not sure what the <laughs> plot of it is necessary. I I could I watched it almost a week ago. I there's there's certain things that stand out about it, but a lot of it has just all about already kind of faded into the ether. You're better for uh, it. Is is Jim Belushi a cop or a private detective? He is a cop. His brother is the wannabe uh state senator. His partner is Tony Goldwyn who is attractive enough. He's certainly the most attractive person in the You know, if you would put Tony Goldwyn in the Jim Belushi role, I I don't know if the movie would have been any better because God knows Tony Goldwyn has made his share of stink bombs. Sure. Uh, And I don't know that he's a particularly great actor, you know, unless he has decent enough material. Yeah. But, um, you know, he's nice enough looking. I would, I would buy him as, as, you know, a, a cop who's maybe, you know, a little, you know, Handsy with the ladies, you know, I mean, or, or certainly irresistible to the ladies. He's, he's very good looking, probably, probably, you know, by far the most good looking actors in the entire movie. Yeah, and halfway um, through the movie, he becomes the protagonist. Like up until this right. point, you are assuming that Jim Belushi is the protagonist. And then the movie's like, um, we've decided to sideline Jim Belushi to make him a, a potential suspect. So now Tony Goldwyn is protagonist. And so as we are alluding to, there's a scene in which he is quote unquote seduced. That- oh my God. <laughs> I love this scene so much. This is, this is, uh, so, so, um, Lorraine, Lorraine Bracco, again, she's like this irresistible man eater. Like no yeah. man can, can stop himself from, you know, wanting to be in her bed. And, mm. and she just, you know, had every fellow up and down, you know, the Florida coast, of <laughs> Palm Beach on the coast. I assume it is. I don't know. Yes. I, I've been to Orlando. That's my entire exposure Sex to Florida. Sex is a handshake to her. And quite frankly, good for her. It's a good for her moment. But you do wonder, fucking why? Why is she chosen I, I, these I, two dickheads to fuck around with? I, I, I don't know, you know what purpose she has in trying to seduce and then later, you know, eventually successfully seducing yeah. Tony Goldwyn. But she does. And this the first time she tries it, this is she, her her seduction technique is literally to take his hand and just plop it on her breast, <laughs> and he starts like shaking and stammering like he like she's a sex worker he's a sixteen year old virgin, <laughs> and he just like like what oh my god what and and, and, and like sir you're married you, can you just you, say you know, no thank you you could say please please don't i'm a married man or you know thanks but no thanks but he's like what why what are you doing what <laughs> and he's just like he's like having a nervous breakdown yeah which seems to turn her on which is a weird fetish but i'm not gonna yuck her yum and, and i think that again he's not he's you know in this he's kind of you know lost at sea mm. i think i i think he doesn't really even know what kind of movie this is he might not have been uh, told this is the thing like i'm not entirely sure every cast member was given the same script they could have all because, been given yeah five different I, versions of the script in which their character made sense but nothing else did and they're like well this is gonna be dumb but my part's great and then when they saw the movie they're like huh huh <laughs> That's what I, that's, that was my role. I did not understand that. Because, because like 20 minutes later or so he, he does, you know, come back and they, they hook up. But I, I guess the idea is he's just so driven a flutter with lust. And it's like, well, that's not what this looks like. You look, <laughs> you look terrified. You look like she's held a knife to your throat. <laughs> he looks like it's a dare. Like, um, like he has to like, one of those things where um, people on the the Amazing Race are told, you're going to have to jump out of this helicopter attached to a bungee cord. And they're like, well, I don't want to do it, but I also can't be in sixth place again. We have we have the opportunity to move ahead. 
I don't know. I haven't watched Amazing Race. And God, I don't even know if it's still on the fucking air. But um, it's kind of like, oh, I don't want to do it. But, you know, it's almost like um, to bring this back to <laughs> Friday the 13th, which I seem to be able to do with every movie we talk about for the last six months. We've found that phenomenon where people just said, oh, um, I'm about to get a hatchet to the face. All right. That's it's like that hatchet yeah, to the face, like, he, replace he, sex. Well, that's the thing. Like, 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 you know, there are definitely, you know, erotic films where the, the idea is this is inevitable. This is going to happen. Right. You know, we, you know, no matter, you know, what circumstances in a person's life, you know, could stop them. You know, Body heat. Uh, the postman right. always rings twice. Right. This is going to, this is going to happen. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I guess, I guess that's the impression you're supposed to get here. That that even though he is, you know, uh, you know, horrified mm-hmm. that you know she is trying to you know get him to feel her up. You know, at the same time he's so turned on by it that's like, well, you know, obviously we're just gonna you know crash into each other again. It's like, no, you can you can avoid this situation. You know? Well, he <laughs> like, does try to fly to, to Key West to to chase down a lead that lead ends up a literal dead end because that person is buried. But she also flies to Key West because she's got to get Tony Goldwyn's dick. It's just has to happen. <laughs> I mean, you know, I see the I seen him without a shirt on and ghost, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a it's a noble goal. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I'm not saying it's a it's a bad goal to have. But in this movie, it's a giant fucking why. It, well, yeah, the, the thing is, it's like none of it, it, you know, we're spending so much time on this this subplot of these two characters, you know, falling into bed together and having this you know heated, passionate affair, and it's just it's absolutely arbitrary to the plot. Yes, it, all it is is filler. It's like he, the person, the screenwriter wrote a serial killer drama. And they're like, all right, that's cool. But I need you to add a whole bunch of sex stuff that is superfluous to this. That Barely. Just, just kind of just t- occupy space in the middle of it to pad out room. And then they got back to the editing bay and they're like, we have a whole hour of the padding and only 45 minutes of the serial killer drama. And they're like, well, put it together because this releases on Tuesday. You know, her, her 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 character is one percent superfluous. You know, as you say, this whole thing with their affair—it's it's, just—it's filler. It's padding. Yeah, yeah. It, there's no point to it. We don't learn anything from it. Their sex scene also is not so hot as to go. Oh my god, this was worthwhile. It no, just, you get your bared boobs shot in a way you could tell it's a body double. Exactly, it's got that, because her it's head got that is turned long, south and, and, it's like, and it's like that long distance, you know, you all the way across the room filming. Right. And again, we're not demanding that Lorraine Bracco get naked for us. No, 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 of course but not. But there's ways to shoot a sex scene that aren't through a window like I'm the fucking perv. Again, <laughs> don't put me in the space. <laughs> where I'm crazy Ralphin, okay? <laughs> this movie seems to think that it'll be better if I'm crazy Ralph, and I don't want to be. I want his posture. That's all I want from his life. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for so long, it is quite possible there are members of our audience that don't know who crazy Ralph is. That is wild to me, and yet... It's probably true. You got you to gotta dip into our archives for that. <laughs> I, I know we gained one listener. Well, not of the week that this will come out, but the week that we're recording, who, who just noticed that we covered all of the Friday the 13th movie. So uh, <laughs> they're out there. <laughs> According to yeah, our numbers. I mean, this, this, this thing with the uh, the erotic thrillers, that's, that's new. We only just started that like a couple months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's paying off huge because ever there's a huge underlying traces of red fandom that's just rabid for someone, anyone to talk about it. And here we are wasting our time and theirs talking about fucking traces of red, which James Belushi just 
yells at co-workers and slams pieces of paper down and grabs people by the collar and stretches out their sweater, a sweater they're wearing in Florida. <laughs> Who the fuck is wearing a sweater in Florida? Oh my God. They, I also like that they, uh, you know, dead ass ripped off, uh, what was the movie with, um, Glenn Close and Jeff Bridges, where she's oh, defending him. Uh, Jagged Edge. Yes, the typewriter thing. Yes. Which was which is also hilariously parodied in an episode of Harvey Birdman. <laughs> <laughs> when are we doing Wait. our Harvey Birdman? Uh, oh my God, series? please. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing about Harvey Birdman. If we did an episode by episode recap of, of that show, um, those episodes are 12 minutes. Compare that to an hour and 44 minutes of Jim James Belushi. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I could, I, could get, I could get a whole hour just out of the. the oh, I'm not uh, saying it would cut down our recording time. I'm saying it would cut down on our watching time. And that <laughs> is paramount to me right now. <laughs> so I've spent more than a month month writing scripts for Oscar hosts who are not hosting the Oscars. And now that I know who is hosting the Oscars and I've known it, well, as of this is coming out, I've known it for like three or four weeks, but even still, uh, just constant writing scripts for fucking Oscar hosts. God damn it. Just watch the fucking Oscars. You don't have to give away a, a like who, who loves Spider-Man in the audience. Jesus Christ. What the fuck is happening to our world? Don't go uh, I, after he, an audience who doesn't want to fucking watch you. They I, don't will, care. I will only watch it if it makes you money somehow. <laughs> Because I, I am I am I am deeply uninterested in seeing Spider Man inevitably win the the you know audience favorite. I don't know. There's and a big uh, we could we listen if it's if the voting is still open by the time this happens, vote for malignant. Get Gabriel throwing a chair across a police station in there because that's a real moment, everyone. I mean, I was gonna vote for Teton, you know, the main character killing a guy by jamming a, uh, a, a hair stick in his ear. Right. <laughs> Cause that's, 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 that's fucking gnarly, man. Have it you seen t yet? Uh, I have seen uh, a quarter of it and then I'm like, uh, Patrick needs sleepy time. Um, and I've found that a lot cause I'm waking up, uh, four times a night with a dog, uh, who is, whose health is failing. So, uh, that's neither here nor there. So uh, I need to find a period of time in which I'm not actively um, trying to keep alive or mourning a dog uh, in order to actually watch Titan. But I'm very much looking forward to watching the rest of it because I enjoyed we, the first we, 15 we could get, minutes. We could get an episode out of that because boy, oh boy, that's got some brutal fucking kills in it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it. It's only, it's only, it's it's top loaded like the first half an hour, but, mm -hmm. but woo wee. <laughs> And then it becomes a, a, a moving family drama. Uh, and then you, but, you, but you know what? The French chick fucking a, fucking a car? Way sexier than anything that happens <laughs> in, uh, in Traces of Red. So in terms of sexiness, Jim Belushi, below car. <laughs> yes, I, I, would, I would say that. <laughs> you heard it here first. Put it on the DVD cover. Put it on that Blu-ray re-release. I, mean, I mean, I'm not saying I would have sex with a car, but mm. I would also not have sex with Jim Belushi. <laughs> But if you had to choose between Jim James Belushi and Carr, I mean, probably Carr. Honestly, okay, yeah. the car, the car wouldn't like smell me in a seductive <laughs> manner. He likes a whiff. This one, uh, it's an interesting character quirk, and I say interesting because so much of the movie is uninteresting to watch. Yeah, this this is the the thing with him smelling the women that he sleeps with is that also ties into they all have the same perfume and i i have and i know that that was explained somehow but i don't know what the what the the you know, the, the what <laughs> twist was for that but apparently every woman in palm beach wears the same high end perfume called nightwing <laughs> nightwing which is the name Named of a after movie? The Bat movie. Yeah, <laughs> was I was gonna say decade. Nightwing. <laughs> Nightwing. <laughs> Nightwing up for contention for uh, Animal Attacks April. I'm I'm gonna put that out there. <laughs> Doesn't that also uh, feature one Armand Asante? It does feature Armand Asante <laughs> again playing someone of of indigenous uh, origins. Um, oh God. 
or is it, no, is it James Franco? I think it's James Franco. No, it can't be James Franco. Oh, no, or, well, it's it? a Franco. Oh, fuck. I was going to say James Franco would have been, would have been like, wing. Jesus would have been like a, a fetus when that came out. No, it, but it's like a, it's a, a what, James Franciscus, maybe. Oh, uh, let's see. Cast. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Anything not to like, avoid talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah. Trace the rat. 19. It, there's been so many night wings. Is it? 1978 Vampire Bats, Nick Mancuso. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, he's an Armando Sante type. Yeah, I mean, like... That's you, sort of that that, that that 70s era of, you know, Italian-American actors who would be cast as Puerto Ricans, as, as indigenous people. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those movies that has the craziest fucking, like, lineage, where the director's Arthur Hiller, who makes... A couple good movies and then the wildest fucking trash piles you've ever seen in your life. And the <laughs> screenplay partially comes from Martin Cruz Smith. Like, what? And yeah, Nick Mancuso <laughs> plays uh, an indigenous uh, cop. Uh, there's literally almost no indigenous actors in it. There's so few and far between. But Catherine Harold is in a jacuzzi in it. So it's got <laughs> that going on. Still sexier than anything that happens in, in Traces of Red. A thousand percent. And David Warner plays like a, uh, your, your, uh, the guy who knows that the bats are coming and, but no one will listen to him sort of thing. I don't know. I think man. you, I think you sold me on this. Oh, God, I wasn't all added to the list because we don't have well, a don't bat think, movie. I don't think I've ever seen it, but I do remember the clips in, um, uh, Terror in the Isles. Right. I mean, listen. Is it a great movie? No. Is it boring? For stretches. Do I have a Blu-ray copy of it? Surprisingly, yes. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right now, listen, it, there's no point in talking about Traces of Fright. It fucking sucks. We've got a shark movie. We've got a, a, a rat movie. We've got a gator movie. Um, and we've got some wild cards, two wild, some wild cards. We've got a snake movie and a, just an animals go crazy movie. So we don't have a bat. So bat we'll have might. To, we'll, have to squeeze a, we'll have to squeeze a bat in there. I think we'll, uh, let's, let's pencil this bad boy in. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, animals that get high on PCP. You're being pushed to 2023. 1978. <laughs> All right. So welcome to Schedule Talk, where we schedule <laughs> movies. Welcome to How the Sausage is Made. <laughs> Why did they decide to talk about Nightwing? I don't know. They were so desperate to not talk about Traces of Red that they it's ended impossible. up talking about Nightwing. It's impossible because nothing about this movie makes sense. Yeah. Nobody in this movie belongs in this movie. And and I, it, it's kind of like a... a yeah, I, I really do think that you're you're absolutely right. I think he's trying more for a Michael Douglas sort of, you know, well dressed, you know, sort of uh, soulless sleazy guy mm -hmm. kind of role. I, I I think that you're probably right about that. That's yeah. that makes that seems more accurate than my assessment of him trying to be a Mickey Rourke type. Yeah, that he just always knows what to say to women and you know get to you know you know get them in the palm of his hand. And like, like he just there's a there's a point at the beginning of the movie where he picks up this waitress, and if you've ever oh my god, it, Michelle like, Joyner from last scene being dropped by Sylvester Stallone from uh, the beginning of Cliffhanger. The good oh, is that who that is? Okay, yeah. Um, they just have the most awkward banter with each other, and then she's hopping in his car and you know letting him take her home with them and and and. And it's just like, Jesus, God. And, and he doesn't take his clothes off when they have sex. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, it's, not Again, not that I want to see Jim Belushi with his clothes off. But also but, he's taken his, his shirt off like dozens of times. Like he's not above taking his fucking shirt off. So the it's like a character choice that he's not taking his clothes off. It's fucking weird. 
You know, like, like there's nothing more annoying in an erotic thriller or a movie that is trying to be an erotic thriller than when they're trying to, you know, clearly make it that they can, you know, they, they can show it on regular television without too much cutting. Right. So you've got a scene where it's sort of, in, it's sort of maybe implied that he goes down on Lorraine Bracco, but, you know, his head just kind of goes off without a frame. Yeah. She leaves her bra on the whole time, which <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, gentlemen, a secret about the ladies, <laughs> we're ta- we take those things off as soon as we walk to the door. <laughs> They're not comfortable. I mean, yeah, if you're if you're wearing a bra for like you know lingerie purposes, fine. You know, you leave it on for a couple minutes, that thing's coming off. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, whether because it's uncomfortable or your partner wants to see you without it on, whatever. It's not staying on the whole goddamn time. And then you've got, you know, the scene later where he does sort of take his clothes off, but then it like cuts like the next day. Yeah. And and he's like laying in bed. Of course, he's got the sheet. Right over the butt, you know, yeah. just just perfectly covering his butt, and it's just like it, it's so like they're they're trying to be like, yeah, wow, this is really racy, and then like it just kind of pulls that punch at the last minute every time. It's bad. It, it's 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 no good. Is this possibly the worst one we've seen so far? Because I, I I feel like. That that you know what we have done so far has peaked like peaked early on with single white female, yeah. which was like the second movie we covered, mm-hmm. and that has just swiftly declined since yeah. then. Let's let's wrap it up, uh, Gina. Where can people find you on the here internet? <laughs> I'm sick uh, of talking about the police. I didn't even mention that the police station is filled with smoke. Where can people find you on the internet? <laughs> I write about TV and movies at the spool.net. Uh, I will be, by the time this goes up, I will have reviews a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I don't feel particularly good about, but we'll see. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> maybe it'll, maybe it'll surprise maybe me. It'll be great. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll, maybe they'll cut that, uh, that, uh, you know, your, your cancel bro part, right. hopefully. And I am on Twitter and Instagram under Gina Does Things. G E N A Does Things. Our theme song is by Revenge Body. Uh, visit them at uh, Bandcamp. Revenge Body, uh, and uh, they've got a whole bunch of remixes of our stuff, and our uh, cover art and all of our pr- pretty much all of our art is uh, by Josh Hollis. You can find us on uh, Twitter, on uh, Facebook. We have a private group for more chats and Instagram. Uh, our Patreon is up, and of course, uh, at the end of uh, last month, we did Halloween 5, and uh, we'll have a, a listener-suggested uh, episode uh, coming up in the middle of this month as well. Uh, thank you to all those people. Uh, so, uh, for myself and for Gina, goodbye, everybody. Bye.